Good morning, Good Shepherd. Good morning. Welcome to our first worship service of 2024. The best way to start our week by worshiping our Lord. And thank you, April, for the beautiful prelude. At this time, I invite you to stand and join me in the call to worship as printed in the bulletin. And uh, just before we start, I'll ask Bethany if she could switch over, thank you, to the uh, service slideshow. Perfect. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Would you please pray with me? Eternal and holy Lord, at the baptism of Jesus in the muddy waters of the Jordan River, your voice boomed from heaven, and you proclaimed him, your beloved son. And you tore open the heavens and sent the Holy Spirit down who anointed Jesus. May we who have been baptized in his name never turn away from your word, and may we never turn away from the needs of your world. But let us reach out to others in love. Help us to act in the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, both now and forever. Amen. And our opening hymn is Here I Am to Worship. Please be seated and welcome to worship at Good Shepherd this morning, the first Sunday of 2024. And at the top of the bulletin, we even got it right and switched it to 2024. That's... <laughs> well, today, following worship, Jason Obermeyer will have a presentation. And, you know, Jesus, our Lord, said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So it's worth putting some time into thinking about your treasures and your legacy. 
and how to uh, support those things that uh, meant a lot to you during your life um, when your time on earth is done and you go to your heavenly home. And um, there's a lot of other things to consider when it comes to finances, and so today is, we'll be taking a, a look at a little piece of that, and so hopefully you can stay. I know about 20 people signed up, but they uh, brought in plenty of extra food, so if you didn't sign up and you're like, you know what, I want to go, uh, please stay and join us. And today, we have something very special taking place, ordination and installation. One of the great events in the life of the church. And so I would ask Elder Peggy Moeller to come forward at this time. And in a moment, I will be asking those who are to be ordained and installed to come forward. Here a statement on ordination and installation. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ through baptism. We are marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, God calls some to a particular service. To some, he calls to be elders. To others, he calls us to be deacons, and to others, to serve as minister of Warden Sacrament, or on the foundation board, or other ways in the church. But ordination is a special event in the church. It's a practice that has been handed down from the earliest days of the church when it comes to our elders and our deacons. And so at this point, I'm going to ask Elder Peggy Moore to present the candidates for both ordination and installation to the various boards of the church. At this time, the session board would like to recognize our outgoing board members. For service on the session, we thank Tori Ford and Ellen Markham. For service on the board of deacons, we thank Diane Moda. For service on the foundation board, we thank Ed Hartley and Bill Rainey. For each of you, your service in love of the Lord and neighbor are greatly appreciated. And now, representing the one holy church bound together everywhere through the faith of Jesus Christ, the session of Good Shepherd installs to active service on the session, Lauren Doggett, Chris Hartley, and Tammy Rickley, class of 2026, who have previously been ordained as elders. The session presents Cheryl Hutchkins and Doug Obermeyer for ordination as elders and installation to active service on the session board, class of 2026. The session also now presents for installation to active service on the board of deacons, Teresa Doe, Diane Gorenson, Naoma Hillegoss, and Mary Stout, class of 2026, who have previously been ordained as deacons. The session also recognizes and installs at this time Gary Heisel and Heidi Schmall to the foundation board, class of 2026. Thank you, Peggy. Ordination calls the whole church to a renewed commitment reminds us to gladly bear the yoke of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given in the covenant of baptism. Let us there together reaffirm our baptismal vows, renouncing what opposes God and God's rule and affirming our faith. So I would ask everybody at this point, if you would stand up and let us all together reaffirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Ghost? I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Oh, what beautiful words. Uh, please be seated. I would ask those who are being installed and ordained to come forward at this time. And Doug and Cheryl, I would ask you two to come up by the baptismal fount. Thank you. I would ask everyone to remember your baptism and be thankful in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We come to a time of the constitutional questions for Cheryl and Doug. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, acknowledge him Lord and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church and God's word to you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you be governed by our church's polity? Will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? And will you seek to serve people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the governing bodies of the church and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of our Lord Jesus Christ? And to the people of Good Shepherd, do you, as members of the church, accept Cheryl and Doug as elders chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, please answer, we do. We do. And do you agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, please answer, we do. We come to a time that is uh, an ancient tradition, the laying on of hands. And so I would ask uh, Doug and Cheryl, if you could come down to uh, the lower level. And I will ask anyone who has previously served as an elder in the church, if you would come and, and maybe go down one more level, guys, so they can <laughs> get a hand on your shoulders. And anyone who would like to come forward who has served as an elder, for the laying on of hands. A chain of service unbroken since the earliest days of the church. Pray with me. O oh, holy, loving, and eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called forth leaders to serve you, and you have equipped them with your gifts. You have given them, you give them the imagination, the intelligence, the desire to serve, and we thank you for that. Among your people, Israel, you anointed prophets, priests, rulers, you called pastors, you called teachers, bishops, elders, deacons, all to build up your church. 
With Moses, the 70 elders bore the burdens of your people, ministering in the power of your spirit. Alongside the prophets, alongside the apostles, the deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, deacons, elders, pastors served together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up in full unity in our Lord Jesus Christ. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and praise. A God of grace, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit uh, right now upon Doug and Cheryl, that they be your faithful elders in the church. Give them prudence. Give them love. Give them sound judgment. Give them wisdom. Give them courage to order the life of your church in obedience to the Holy Scriptures. Nourish them in life through the Holy Spirit. Guide them in governance of this session that they may be servant leaders following Jesus Christ who came not to be served but to serve. And he gave his life to set others free. Give them joy in their service and joy in their walk of faith. Give them a sure sense of your presence in all of their work of ministry. Uh, Heavenly Father, we pray all of this in the strong, loving, and powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Doug and Cheryl, you are now elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. And now receive the charge. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift you have received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belongs glory, power, now and forever. Amen. At this time, I would ask that we greet one another and welcome Doug and Cheryl as not just session members, but elders for life in the Church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. Congratulations, Doug and Cheryl. We all look forward to working with you for years to come on the session. And at this time, we have a children's message. So any children who would like to come forward, come on up. Welcome, everybody, and you're in luck. I have some jokes for you today. Why did Noah have to punish the chickens on the ark? Because they were using foul language. (laughs) 
What did what do pirates what did do pirates call Noah's Ark? They call it an ark. Uh, you know, all right. <laughs> well, I brought with me my phone today, and um, you know, a phone's kind of a modern photo album. Anybody have a photo album at home? You put the old-fashioned pictures in that you print off. You have one? That you you do? Nice. Okay. You do too? Yeah. Uh, you know, I used to print them all out and put them in there, but now they're, they're on my phone and they're on the cloud. In fact, I have 5,126 pictures in here now. <laughs> and if you stroll, you know, scroll through my pictures... What do you think you're going to find a lot of in here? Family. Yes, my family, my daughter, and, and my dogs, yes. I'd say 90% of my pictures are family, dogs, or nature, and then a few other odds and ends. But, yeah, if you go through them, I see if I can find one here. Well, let's see, there's one of pretty much all of my girls in one shot. Recognize yourself there? Yeah. <laughs> now... I keep my pictures on this phone. What about God? What do you think? Do you think he has a giant phone, like an iPhone 12,000, that he, he keeps all these pictures in? No? You don't think so? Well, does he have a giant photo album? Anybody has a photo album that's like 2 million pages long, full of all your pictures? You think he has a photo album? What do you think? You might. <laughs> Well, I think God probably doesn't need to have a phone or a photo album. Why is that? He yes, he remembers everything. Everything you've ever done, every moment of your life he has in his memory. In fact, he knows everything you've done and everything you're going to do. You are so precious to him that he remembers everything about you. Um, you know, you're, you're his children. And so he loves you, and kind of like um, a human will keep pictures of their kids on their phone, he has pictures of you, and you might think of it like this, your picture is on his refrigerator. He loves you that much. Now, Jesus was God's son. And do you think God was proud of his son? Yeah, he was pretty proud of his son. Because, you know, his son got baptized. And when he got baptized, he came up out of the water. And you know what happened when he came up out of the water? But you know what happened? Yes, Mark says the, the heavens were torn open. I love the way Mark puts that. Torn open and down dropped the Holy Spirit on Jesus, and the voice of God boomed, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Aren't those wonderful words? He was certainly very proud of his son. And we do baptism here too, and I, I remember baptizing you, Sonia. You, you remember it? You were only like three, so you probably don't. <laughs> um, that was a long time ago. And uh, but baptism is a very neat event. Why don't we head over here to the, uh, to the baptismal font and take a little look at it here. Usually they're eight-sided, representing the eight souls that were on the ark, but ours is six-sided, so it's a little different. Um, but, you know, we, we get water, and, you know, we have this water flown in from Israel. They, they get it from the River Jordan. We, no, <laughs> I'm joking. It's just, we, you're supposed to just use the water that's common to the area where you live. So this is tap water. I, I could even drink it, and I would be fine. Uh, so we use regular water, and we can baptize people by sprinkling on your head. Or in some places, you can be dunked in a tank. I, I was in a church that dunked us in a tank, so I got dunked. Uh, but it's the same thing. And how many times during your life should you get baptized? Just once? Not three or four times? No, one time. 
uh, is all you need to be baptized because God is faithful. Now, uh, you know, Martin Luther said people who get baptized again are kind of insulting God, like saying, God, you're probably not remembering that I got baptized, so I'm going to do it again. Uh, no, you only need to do it once for your entire life. And when you're baptized, it's kind of like you're adopted into the household of God. Now, it's, it's an official marking that you have entered the household of God. It's, it's a uh, public event. We don't do baptisms in private. Um, you know, we don't have a secret room in the back where, you know, we, we shut everybody out and we do a, some secret ritual. It's out in the open. It's a public confession. The only time it would be done in a private setting ordinarily would be if somebody were dying and, and they said, Pastor Jeff, would you baptize me? Well, in that kind of a situation, you better get it done quickly, right? <laughs> and you don't have time to uh, stage a big event. Uh, but ordinarily, it's something that would happen out in front of everybody, and it signifies that you are now officially part of God's family under the covenant of, of God. And um, it's kind of like um, the way they thought about it in the old days. It's not so much true anymore, but kings would have a special ring. And they say they wrote a letter with some new laws. You know what they would do? They would put wax on it, and the king would stamp it with his ring. And that would tell everybody, this is official. And so that's how they used to think of baptism. It's kind of like that, that now you can know that it's official. You belong to God. And God is faithful. And so you know that God will be with you your whole life. And so it's also a... Um, Part of it is becoming part of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, baptism is very important in life. It's not something that should be passed over. It's something uh, that a Christian should do. Uh, do you have any questions about baptism? Okay, well today is, I don't know if you knew it, it's Baptism of the Lord Sunday. And it's the Sunday after Epiphany every year. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about baptism of the Lord in our message. And so right now, would you join me in a word of prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would let our own baptisms, our memory of them, or the fact that we know we were baptized and our parents had it done on our behalf because they loved us and wanted us to be under your covenant, let that be an assurance to us that we belong to you that you love us, and we love you. Uh, Heavenly Father, it is in the name of Jesus, your beloved Son, in whom you are well pleased that we pray these things. Amen. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Would you please stand and we will sing We Three Kings of Orient Are Verses, I'm sorry, verses 1, 2, and 5 <laughs>
Before we read our scripture today, I invite you to join me in prayer for illumination. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to hear your word read to us and explained to us, we hope that you quiet our restless souls and our restless hearts so we fully understand what you mean to say to us today. Amen. The first piece of scripture is from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah, the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight his paths for him. Make straight paths for him. Same part is chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn down and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels, attended by, atten, the angels attended him. Thank you, Lori. Well, I'd like to start and today and ask you, what are some famous opening lines of books that you know? Does anybody have a famous opening line you might share with us? It was the best of times, it was the worst. Ah, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That was the first one that came to my mind, too. And what, what did that come from? Yeah, Tell of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. How about another one? I think I saw someone else. Someone else going to chime in? In the beginning. In the be that is the greatest opening line in history. The Holy Bible, Genesis 1 1. Yes, that is a good one. Once upon a time, Once upon a time yes. <laughs> uh, how about this one? All of this happened more or less. May know what this was? So I think it's one of the best books ever written. Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. Um, it was about uh, his experience hiding out in Slaughterhouse Number 5 during the uh, firebombing of Dresden in World War II. Uh, how about this one? Call Me Ishmael. Moby Dick. Yes, Moby Dick, uh, Herman Melville. Ah, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. It's right there in the name, right? The <laughs> Hobbit. So you know that one. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. Yes, I heard it. 1984 by George Orwell. And, of course, as Dr. Tim pointed out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the greatest opening lines in history. When an author crafts the opening lines of a book or a story, uh, they're trying to point toward a message or an intent. And so the, evan the uh, evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, did the same thing. The opening lines of all of their Gospels really point you toward the, where they're heading with their particular angle on the story of Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but if you see artwork of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John you will see that they're often associated with particular animals. Um, you see, a, Dr. Luke is uh, associated with a bull. Uh, John is associated with an eagle. And uh, Mark, a lion. And uh, Matthew with an angel, uh, very commonly. Now, 
Matthew opens his gospel saying, this is the record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then he lays out a genealogy. It's probably not the most exciting reading you're ever going to come across. But Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. It was very important that he establish that Jesus was from the line of Abraham if he was going to get anywhere with his audience. And Luke, he begins, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from whom uh, the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, who was the patron underwriting the uh, writing of this gospel, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Right away you get the idea that Luke has a logical mind. Uh, he takes a, historic, a historian approach. You're going to get a very detailed, thorough accounting of Jesus' life from Luke. Ah, John. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm sorry, John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning, he was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And John, you kind of get the idea that he's, um, I don't know, to me, I picture him sitting under a shade tree on a beautiful sunny day, uh, waxing poetic. I mean, his, his prose is just absolutely beautiful, and I uh, mentioned the eagle. He's often associated with the eagle uh, because his gospel, more than the others, focuses on the divinity of Christ. And it's often called the spiritual gospel. And so he's often associated with that eagle. And then we get to Mark. Um, in the beginning, the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And this is why Mark is often associated with the lion. You picture a lion roaring. And you hear right from the beginning of his gospel, John the Baptist yelling, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make a straight path for him. Uh, Mark's gospel is the shortest. It's very direct, compact, a tight story. He uses the word immediately, or the, you know, be the Greek version of the word immediately, like 42 times. Things happen quick. Jesus was a man of action. Now, as one continues to read Mark, you will find right away after he tells you about John the Baptist, he tells you at that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And then you keep reading the Gospel of Mark and you find that Jesus was the Son of God. He was tempted, but was without sin. He performed miracles. He taught as one with authority. And as the Gospel began with the cry of John the Baptist, it ends with the cry of Jesus Christ. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And a question for those reading through the Gospel of Mark might be, why in the very beginning of his ministry did Jesus get baptized? And it's stated in just such a plain, matter-of-fact way. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. There's no explanation, no elaboration. This is vintage Mark, to the point. Well, why was Jesus baptized at all? Baptism before Jesus came along was a ritual of purification and repentance. It symbolized the washing away of sins and an individual's commitment to a new life aligned with God's will. It was deeply spiritual, signifying a moral and spiritual renewal. When somebody went to get baptized by, say, John the Baptist, they were saying, I'm changing 
It's not the old me anymore. I'm, I'm going a new direction. I'm going to follow God. So why would the sinless Son of God submit to a baptism? Well, Jesus himself tells us a little bit about it. But Jesus had no skeletons in his closet, right? I mean, he didn't have any deeds done in darkness that he preferred to remain in darkness. But he said that he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Matthew 3.15. He meant that he was completing what was right and what was ordained by God. This act was part of God's redemptive plan. And it showed that Jesus fully identified with humans in our sinfulness, even though he was sinless. It's an example of obedience to God's will. And he set an example for us as his believers. And Jesus came along and he shattered the delusions of the people. They thought a Messiah was going to come in great glory with a host of an army of angels and was going to wipe out the Romans. Instead, Jesus comes and sets an example of service. From the beginning of his ministry, he declared to the people, I'm not going to be the Messiah that you expect. There are no shortcuts. I'm going to pay the price in full for your sin. Has anybody heard about the great molasses flood of 1919? You've heard about it, yeah. It's really a strange event. Uh, two million gallons of molasses went flowing through uh, North Boston. And I think it was like, Jan was it January yeah, 15th of 1919? And, you know, you might at first think, well, that's kind of cool. I mean, if it was like honey or something, you'd probably be out there collecting it, enjoying it. Or if it was chocolate, it would really be thrilling. But... <laughs> The problem was, when two million gallons come bursting out of a tank all at once, it was a wave 40 feet high that traveled at 30 to 35 miles per hour, and 21 people were killed. 150 were injured. It took 87,000 worker hours to clean it up. When it turned out that the owners of the company, you see it was called the... Um, Purity Distilling Company took a little shortcut. They didn't properly engineer the tank. Instead, they just eyeballed it. You know, get me metal, sheet metal of X thickness and build me a gigantic tank. Shortcuts can lead to disasters. And Jesus declared, I am your Messiah, and there will be no shortcuts. I am doing the work of saving you, and I'm going to do it properly and I will fulfill all righteousness. And another thing that Jesus was doing in his baptism, he was bringing us to God and bringing God to us, which was a radically new idea at that time. Jesus was no distant deity. He entered fully into the creation that he himself created. He stepped into the waters of the Jordan River and underwent baptism to bring us to God and bring God to us. There are those who say that Christianity is a custodian of the past, but that is not so. The baptism of Jesus was a complete break with the past. Before Jesus, God was inaccessible. Before Jesus, God was bound up with a thousand little rules that the scribes and Pharisees had erected that only they could decipher. You know, as humans, we love setting up these kind of rules. It makes us feel like we're in control of who has access to God and who doesn't. Before Jesus, God was concealed in an elaborate temple, a sacrificial system, a priestly order, inner courts and outer courts that a person could never penetrate. God was behind the veil. And even if you were a priest, the vast majority of them would never step beyond that veil. But with Jesus, dawned a new day. Jesus came along with scissors in hand. 
God-sized scissors. And in his baptism, he began to cut that veil. He began to snip at it. Because of what Jesus did. When you and I come into the sanctuary, there is no veil hiding God. There's no inner court and outer court with rules of who can go into which one. There's no railings keeping you back from God. We don't have any secret rituals. We simply say God is available to you through Jesus Christ. When Jesus offered himself to baptism by John in the Jordan, he was declaring, it's a new day. And God spoke from heaven. And there are only three times in the New Testament where God speaks from heaven. The first was at Jesus' baptism. God said, you are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Anybody know the second time God spoke from heaven? It was at the transfiguration. And he said, this is my beloved son whom I am, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And the third time was when the shadow of the cross was about to fall upon Jesus. A crowd gathered about him and suddenly a voice from heaven said, I have glorified your name and I will glorify it again. Each time God spoke to express his love for Jesus, his son, God, come to us. And in case you're not aware of it, both of those phrases that God spoke from heaven at Jesus' baptism are quotes from Scripture. You are my beloved son comes from Psalm 2-7, which reads, I will, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And what was that all about? Well, that was part of the coronation language that Israel used when they brought a new king forward and coronated them. It was language affirming that this king was king because of a divine appointment. And so by saying that language at Jesus' baptism, God was affirming his messianic kingship. Jesus is king. And the last part of it, with you I am well pleased, is a quotation of Isaiah 42.1, which speaks of a Messiah who will come to serve and to suffer for us. The message is plain. Jesus saves us by going down into the waters of the Jordan, thus identifying himself with us, and then climbing out of the waters onto a repulsive blood-stained cross to take away our sins. And on that cross, when he died, the work was complete on our behalf. The veil was cut from top to bottom. Jesus made the final cuts, and it was literally torn from top to bottom. And we will all now join together and remember what Jesus did for us through the Lord's Supper. Let us prepare our hearts for communion with God and communion with one another as followers of Jesus Christ. I would ask at this time for the servers to come forward. Would you join me in the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. As this new day has dawned across the globe, God's people began to gather for worship, some to silence, some to the sounds of drums, some to organs and pianos, some to praise bands, and we too are part of this worldwide chorus. On this day the Lord has made, we remember 
that the scriptures are fulfilled. As people will come from east and west, and from north and south, and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. So come, not because you must, but because you may. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for this meal. That your son, Jesus Christ, came. That he submitted to baptism by John in order to identify with us. And that he instituted this meal that we would remember his sacrifice because of his great love for each and every one of us. And we remember that we will enjoy this meal with him one day and that we are grateful to be a part of your kingdom, Heavenly Father. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Friends, the Apostle Paul wrote to us that he received from the Lord Jesus what he also handed on to us, that on the night when he's betrayed, Jesus took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Friends, the gifts of God are ready for the people of God. The Lord's Supper is open to all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Let us hold each element and we will take them together.
body of Christ broken for you, the bread of life. Let us stand and join together singing our closing hymn, Baptized in Water.
receive the good words, the benediction, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and indeed every day. Amen. Thank you.